please take your Bibles out, if you would, and turn to the book of Romans. This is not the passage we're going to look at, but it's a passage that deals with the subject matter. Romans chapter 3. I was just thinking as we were singing that song, um, that imagine back in the early church, in the early book of Acts, where uh, the Jewish Christians were thinking that the church was still a Jewish entity. And they were thinking that primarily God was just working in the hearts of Jewish people. And, and a lot of that comes from their background, comes from their uh, things that they've been uh, taught, uh, religiously speaking. Uh, but imagine if that were true. Where would that leave the rest of us? I mean, most of us would be left out, right? I don't know if there's any of you that have uh, Jewish blood flowing in your veins. I certainly don't have any. And uh, that would leave us out. But God is doing something different. We've reached that point in the book of Acts where he's doing something different to where he's showing the gospel is not just for the Jews. It's for the whole world. We're going to get into that. Well, this passage here in Romans chapter 3 is going to get on to that whole idea where the Apostle Paul is showing that salvation's through faith. It's not by obeying a group of laws and rules and so forth. And he picks it up here in Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Paul says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Wherefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or, if he, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. And of course, Paul goes on. What he's saying is that even Abraham, when the Bible pronounced him as a believer, as saved, the word we would use today, it was before he did any of the rules and regulations God had given him because he came to God by faith. And we're going to see more of that today as, uh, as we continue on into our passage. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll sing one more song. Father, we thank you um, that we see as we study the scriptures that you've opened the gospel up to all of us. All of us, Lord, no matter of our heritage, uh, no matter uh, even the, the amount of sinfulness we have in our lives, we can still turn to you and by faith receive the forgiveness of sins. We're, we're grateful for that. And uh, we pray that you would uh, impress that on our minds today and help us to learn and see exactly what you're doing at uh, this point in the book of Acts where we're going to be. Thank you, Father. Um, Lord, we ask that you would bless Donna as she is with her dad today and, and as it, it looks dire uh, for her father. Uh, we pray that you would give her peace and give her comfort. Lord, especially between the two of them, knowing that, that Ed is, is saved, that he knows Jesus as his Savior. And, and uh, we pray that you'd give them great peace and comfort in all of that. And uh, just give Donna and the rest of the family wisdom as they try to figure out exactly what uh, care... Uh, uh, he would need at this point in time. Thank you, Father. Bless them. Now, Lord, as we continue on, uh, open up our hearts uh, to worship you and to learn from you. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll see that I've entitled the uh, message, Breaking Down Walls. And um, it got me to thinking of different walls that, uh, that we've had to break down or that we've seen uh, broken down. Uh, for instance, in our country, uh, we still see the reverberating, but what about the whole ethnic walls that were in our country? You think of uh, of the uh, civil rights movement and, and things of that nature. Um, I certainly am glad that racial prejudice has been being broken down. It's still got a ways to go. There's still uh, plenty of people with uh, racial prejudice and, and maybe even find yourself struggling with, with some of those things from time to time. But I'm glad uh, that, that those things are in the process of going out. Uh, Martin Luther King, I appreciate the movement that he got started. Now, I, I don't hold with him, especially theologically speaking. I know he's supposed to be a Baptist minister, but his, his theology was quite a bit different from, from where we would stand. 
But with that all set aside, the, the movement, the, the idea of, of getting equal rights for people of, of other ethnic groups is a wonderful thing. And, and, and I'm certainly grateful uh, that we are there. It reminded me of, a, of a, a, an episode of Little House on the Prairie. I know, I watch all the man shows, but uh, uh, an, an old episode I haven't seen in a while of Little House on the Prairie where there was a, there was a fellow that was prejudiced. Uh, and 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 what what it was is they were they were transporting some, what was it? Um, oh, it was the explosive, the liquid explosive. Liquid. What was that? Hydro, hydro, yeah, hydroglycerin. Yeah. Or, okay, forget it. But at any rate, you know what I'm talking about. They were they were doing it, and uh, Charles and Mr. Edwards had one wagon. They're trying to be careful; the slightest bump would blow them up. And then on this other wagon was this guy. Uh, this white man and a black man, and they were working together. Well, the white man just hated that he was working with this black man. And he just hated it, and he was treating him badly. And the black man was a nice guy, uh, you know, be it here or there. But still, it was, a, it was a rough time. Well, by the end of the show, the white man was starting to see uh, where his thinking was bad. And uh, they, they actually got on a train to go home because they were working for the railroad. The train was sending them home. So all four of them got and they went into a, the passenger compartment. Well, the train conductor came out and he looked at the black man and said, you can't ride in here. you got to get out. And he made him get out and go get on a flatbed car right behind the passenger car. And, well, Charles and Mr. Edwards, they got out and went with it. But they didn't like it. And the train starts going along the road. And pretty soon, here comes the other guy. He gets up. He goes up there and sits by him, and they're all kind of watching, wondering what's going on. He looked at him and said, turns out he didn't like Irish people either. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, ethnic uh, prejudice just doesn't have a place. It doesn't have a place in the church. Once in a while you'll hear people trying to use the scriptures to support their ideas for eth ethnic prejudice, but you just need to trust me, they're twisting the scriptures. It's just not right. And so I'm, I'm glad that that's, that's, you know, a battle that's been going on. Uh, sometimes, though, breaking down walls just simply involves change. It's, it's not necessarily a matter of right and wrong and trying to right a wrong, but it's a matter of things just changing. For instance, uh, when televisions first came out, there were a lot of people that said, oh, oh, that TV, that's just a passing fad. It'll never last. Uh, they did the same thing with computers, didn't they? All oh, those computer things, they'll never take off. Where in the world would we be now? With, I mean, every one of you probably have a computer in your pocket now, don't you? Uh, you know, I left mine on the desk in there. Uh, try to remember to turn it off so it doesn't ring uh, for me. I just read the other day where uh, they were talking about Google. When Google first came out, you know, Google's like one of the biggest search engines around right now. Well, the guys who were trying to make Google work, they had come up with a scheme on how it could work, how it could search the whole Internet and, and do the things that it was doing. And then they were trying to sell it to investors. Well, there were a couple investors that said, nope, this thing will never work. There was one set of investors from a search group called Excite. Does some of you remember that? Excite? And uh, they, they were offered it for a million dollars, and they said, nope. Why? Uh, searching's free. There's other people that do searching. What do we want it for? So they turned it down. They came back and offered it to them for $750,000, and, and they still said, no, this is just, it's not even necessary anymore. So they said, forget it. So the, the people from Excite didn't, didn't buy it. Well, pretty soon Google took off. And Google is now worth, I think it's worth well over, well over a couple billion dollars at any rate. So these guys missed their chance. And by the way, who's Excite? Do you know who Excite is? Excite was bought by uh, another group that ended up turning it into the name Ask.com. Remember Ask Jeeves? I think they're the ones that bought it. And now it's Ask.com. And, and who are they? Well, they're certainly not Google, are they? So, so, you know, there, there, were, there was a change that should have taken place, and they just didn't see it. So a lot of times change can happen, and change can be a good thing. Well, what we're going to see today in the book of Acts is a huge, huge change that is, that is taking place. In fact, chapter 10 of the book of Acts, chapter 10 and chapter 11, is bigger than we quite often think about. This is a huge, momentous time. In God's program of what he's doing in the world, especially now that the church has begun and what God is doing. This is a, this is a watershed moment. We're going to see it in the book of Acts. 
It's a watershed moment. It's, it's extremely important. And I'll be honest with you, I struggled this week with how do I, how do I organize this? How do I, how do I put it to, to where I can get across some of these ideas uh, in an organized fashion? And, and I finally come around to what I'm going to do, but I had to divide it in half. I'm going to finish it next week. Uh, but we're going to look at the first part. We're going to look at chapter 10 at this point in time. So I'm going to uh, read as we go and talk about some things as we go. But we're also going to have to look at several other scripture passages. Because, like I said, this is a momentous time. This is something big that is going on in the church. Uh, we're going to begin here in chapter 10, and we're going to see under the idea here of revealing. God is going to reveal to two people what he's doing. He's going to reveal to Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And he's going to reveal to Peter, who is a Jew and one of the leaders in the new church. Now, there's a couple of ways you could look at it. You could look at this story in chapter 10 as just two individuals being brought together for the sake of the gospel. And, and that certainly happens. But you would miss the bigger story if that's what you focused on. You should be focusing on the idea that God is doing something of great importance at a significant crossroad in the history of what he's doing biblically or in the history of the church. And that's what we're going to focus on here. Well, let's, let's just read the story to get the, the actual uh, details here, uh, beginning with Cornelius in uh, verse 1 of chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea named or called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier who was uh, uh, from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So we're beginning with Cornelius. Cornelius is a person who is, he, he's, he's seeking after God. And he's actually worshiping the true God, as we would know him, the, the God of the scriptures, but at the time it was all in, in Jewish form. So he was, he was kind of following and, and helping out the Jews, even in, in that particular area. But he's, he's searching after God. He's seeking something, okay? And this vision is telling him, okay, send for Peter. He's going to help you out. However, Peter's a Jew. And you remember in these days, the Jews had issues with the Gentiles. And the Jews thought they had biblical evidence saying that the Gentiles are all dogs and just stay away from them. And that was the idea that they were looking at. But God is going to have to work on Peter's heart, work on Peter's thinking to get him to see what God is now beginning to do here. Let's begin in verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet abound at, abound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Well, first of all, you have to admit, pretty weird story, isn't it? Now, it's weird for us. We're, most of us are Gentiles. And we don't get the food regulations and all that stuff that the Jews lived under. But it, it still seemed pretty weird that this thing would happen. And I know it seemed weird to Peter. But I would like to say this. I'm proud of Peter. He's a typical male. This all has to do with his stomach. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the saying? The quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? Um, I, I got to think, you know... It, as I focus on that idea, it's amazing how often my stomach uh, drives certain things. Uh, for instance, just, just to give you an idea, Lynn and Whitney and I, we like to watch movies. We'll watch uh, various movies and so forth. We, we don't tend to watch a lot of regular TV. 
when we watch movies. But I was thinking of one is a Christmas movie, Home Alone. Remember in Home Alone, most of you are familiar with Home Alone. Remember the time when he gets the house ready because these two guys said they're coming at 9 o'clock. He gets the house ready, and then he sits down at 8.59, and he's got a bunch of macaroni and cheese in front of him. And then right as he starts eating, he goes, ding, and he looks at me and says, okay, it's time for that. And I said to Lynn Whitney, it always bugged me that he had the mac and cheese ready, and he didn't eat it. <laughs> he walked away from the mac and cheese. What is wrong with that? And, and I find that I have food issues because I find myself doing that in lots of movies. It's like, uh, well, come on, eat. It's there for you. Well, at any rate, uh, God's going to use Peter's stomach here. But more so than even his stomach, he's going to use these food laws. And, and there's a clash going on right here with this whole idea of the food thing. He's told to rise and, and kill and eat. And Peter's saying, no, Lord, I only eat what's clean. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, there were lots of laws telling them what animals were clean and what animals were unclean. You could eat these, and you're not supposed to eat those. And that was the struggle. Well, okay, that's where Peter finds himself. What's the significance of all that? Well, what exactly does all that mean? Why, why is that important? And believe it or not, it's extremely important to what God is doing here. God is going to make a change. And, and we need to see that. It, it, it's significant here. God's going to make a change. Now, God is not going to change. But what he does is going to change, at least somewhat. And that's what we need to see. Now, I got to thinking of other times when, uh, when there are changes that happen, when the person making the change hasn't changed it at all. They still have the same purpose in mind, but they just do things a little differently, right? For instance, if, you, uh, if you're a chef and you wanted to cook eggs, there's those food issues coming up again. But if you wanted to cook eggs, one, one time you're cooking eggs for breakfast, you want to do them over easy, right? So how do you do it? You're careful. You don't want to break the yolk. You didn't cut the yolk. I'm going to you that yolk all through everything, right? Yeah, so, so, so you're careful. But then the next day you want to do scrambled eggs. What do you do that day? You just take them and you mash them all up and get them all mixed together. Well, what, what, what is it? How are you going to do it? Well, it depends on what you're doing, right? It depends on what it is you're trying to prepare. You're still the same chef. You just have different purposes here. Uh, think about a deer hunter. Uh, the same deer hunter could use totally opposite um, strategies for getting his deer. For instance, uh, a deer hunter might do sitting still. You're sitting still. Maybe you're in a shanty or you're, or you're in a ground blind or something of that uh, effect. And you're sitting still waiting. You want to be quiet. You don't want to make any noise. Well, what if you're a deer hunter and uh, it's maybe late in the season now. And you want to kick up the deer so someone can get a shot. And now you're going to put together a deer drive, right? And you're doing the exact opposite. Now you're making noise. Now you want the deer to be afraid of you and to run out in, in front of you. You, you get my point? And you're doing things differently. You're the same hunter. You've got the same goals in mind. Uh, you're still the same person, but you're using different strategies with the way that you're doing it. I even thought about it with football. There are times when a team wants to use the clock as fast as they can. You know, like a team that might have a good running game. They, they, use, they keep running the ball because the, the clock doesn't stop after each play. Uh, and so they, they, they want the clock to run so that it runs out. Maybe they've got a two-touchdown lead, and they don't want to give the other, time, the other team time to score more points. But if you're, the shoe's on the other foot and now you're behind, now you want to save the clock, and you want to get the, stop the clock every chance you can. So you throw the ball a lot more because every drop past the clock stops. You see what I mean? Same team, same coach, but you're using different methods. That's what God is doing here. God is, is going to change the way he's doing certain things. It doesn't mean that God is different. We get accused of that sometimes in the church. Sometimes in the church, people, especially if Jewish people want to look at it, they're saying that we're trying to make a totally different God. Uh, the God of the Old Testament. That's not the case. God was doing things with Israel. Now he's going to change, at least for a time, how he's doing things on, on the earth. And I want to look at that as we go. That's what's going on uh, right here. He's going to be changing some of these regulations. Let me ask uh, this question first of all. Why did Israel have all of these meticulous regulations? Especially when we're talking about food. God is using food as an example to Peter here. Why do they have all those different regulations? I know some people that want to break it down to dietary things. They say, well, God didn't want them eating pork because pork would, would be unhealthy and they couldn't, they couldn't keep it preserved. And, and he's trying to help Israel to be healthier. Well, the fact of the matter is there's an awful lot of healthy people in the communities around them that ate pork. So that doesn't seem to really hold water. 
And you can look at all of the other regulations that they had. Why is God doing that? Well, I'm going to turn to the book of Leviticus for a moment. And by the way, I'm going to look at several passages. You're welcome to turn there or just listen or write it down and look it up later. But in Leviticus chapter 20, right as they're being given a lot of the uh, food regulations and so forth, um, um, Moses says this in Leviticus chapter 20. I'm going to begin reading at verse 24. Actually, he's recording that this is what God is saying to them. Uh, I'm going to start back up at at verse 22 instead. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nations which I am casting out before you. For they commit all these things. He just listed a bunch of different types of sins and so forth. And therefore I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. Don't miss that phrase right there. God said, I have separated you from the peoples. God wants to have this group of people be marked as different. I want there to be very obvious that you are a different people from all the different groups that are there. Let me keep reading. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean animals, unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. See, what God is doing here is he is creating a a situation, or if you want to say it, he's creating a system to where his people will be made to look different. If you will, you can put it today. When uh, when two uh, high schools get together and want to play a basketball game, they don't come in street clothes, do they? They come wearing their jerseys. And this team is blue and white, right? Blue and white? This team is green and white. Who's that one? Okay, this is going to go there. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's a way of making them different. And I believe that's part of what God was doing. He was making Israel different from all their neighbors around them. And some of the regulations that he gave, it wasn't so much a matter of, is it sinful to eat a reptile? <coughs> as much as it is that God said, look, that's something that they do, they're known for, you're not going to eat reptiles. That, that's kind of what he was doing, and, and he listed several other things like that. Now, I'm really simplifying the matter. I know that there's more to it than that, but to a large degree, God was doing it so that his people would look different from the other people. And I even read one commentator that suggested that God was even making it so that it would be a little difficult for them to get together and, and socialize. You know, when, when their barbecues have all kinds of food that you guys don't can't eat and are told not to eat, less likely to go and spend a lot of time at their barbecues, and you don't have your own barbecue, and they won't necessarily want to come to your barbecue. Not that God never wanted them to intermingle, because God wasn't locking the, the uh, Gentiles out. I'll show you uh, what I mean by that in just a moment. But what he was doing was making them different, so that there was obviously something different about them, and that's why they had all of those particular things. One of the things that Israel missed is that God wanted them to be different. Why? So that they could have a testimony to the rest of the world. God wanted Israel, actually, to draw other people to God, to himself. And that's part of what he was doing. Now, the Israelites completely missed that point, and they turned it into something to where we're better than everybody else. The rest of the Gentiles are just Gentile dogs. We're God's people. He loves us because we're wonderful. And, and they missed God's point altogether. Sometimes. Sometimes they got it. I was uh, reading, I'm, I'm still reading through my Bible this year, and I read this last week in the book of First Kings. And in First Kings chapter 8, I'm not going to bother turning there right now, but Solomon was dedicating the temple. In fact, I am going to turn there. I, I want to just read it to you real quick. You don't have to turn there. But in First Kings chapter 8, Solomon is dedicating the temple, and a couple times he says, God, when your people pray toward this temple, hear from your throne in heaven and answer their prayers. And he, he went through several things like that, you know, whether they were having troubles or whether they were being blessed or however, and he read those things. But then he said this in uh, verse 41. He said, moreover, concerning a foreigner, this is in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake. This is a person who's come to worship God. 
even though they're not a Jew. He says, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outreached arm. And when he comes and prays toward this temple, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. And that was in Solomon's prayer as he's dedicating the temple. He understood that one of the things Israel should do is by living for God, they should be drawing other people to God. Now, they weren't very good at it. They, 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 they failed. And a lot of times their people would get superior mentality. You know, they were sinners like us, and they turned everything into something that just benefited them and pushed everyone else away. However, we do find in the New Testament there's a number of people that were drawn to God one way or another. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? We already saw him in Acts. He was somehow drawn to God. Uh, several centurions that we've come across already in the, in the book of Acts, they were drawn to God as well because obviously they came across people whose faith was genuine and they wanted something like that. But Israel as a whole was missing that. So uh, Israel was given these regulations so that they would be different and actually be used to draw people to God. Now the church, there's a big difference here. God wanted Israel to be different and stand out from the world. And so he gave them these regulations. But in the church, the church is now different. The church is now going to not be an ethnic entity. Instead, the church is going to be made up of people from all over the world. I, and I'm not even talking about us living differently as far as morally, uh, living according to other moral principles. So we're, we can get into that later. But the idea that we are all, we are all, we all have the opportunity to be a part of a church. God is doing something different now. So therefore, the regulations that were used to separate peoples, like it did with Israel from their neighbors, is no longer needed. And God's not going to use those principles anymore. Instead, he's going to do things differently. Remember last week we looked at Matthew 8, verse 11, where Jesus was talking about a centurion. And he said, this is, this is the greatest faith I've seen around. He said, but you need to know I, there's going to be people coming from the east and the west to sit down from, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some of the people who are of Israel themselves aren't even going to be here. They're going to be cast out. You know, so even Jesus was talking about it back then. The disciples didn't pick up on it. But Jesus was talking about it. In a John chapter 10, uh, Jesus is talking about his sheep Israel. He says, I am the good shepherd. But then he ends that passage by saying, I have other sheep from a different fold. They're going to be brought in as well. I believe he's talking about us. Talking about the Gentiles. I already read in Romans chapter 3 where he was talking about the idea that it's not by obeying the rules of the Old Testament, being circumcised and doing all the other things that they did, but rather it was salvation by faith. Yes, God still wanted you to be obedient, but you got into the family by faith. And then you followed uh, with, with obeying him after that. Well, I want to turn to one other passage, and I'd like you to turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 2. If you're in Acts, you've got Romans, and then First and Second Corinthians, and then Galatians and Ephesians after that. So turn a few books over. Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is going to talk about this exact same idea. Ephesians chapter 2, I want to begin reading at verse 11. Paul says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. In other words, he said, you're Gentiles. You were called uncircumcised by the Jews because they were circumcised. That's basically what he says. Verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You were once far off. And you weren't, you, you weren't even a part of it. You, you were from the wrong country. You had the wrong blood flowing through your veins. But now through Jesus Christ you've been brought near. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, in other words, to the Gentiles and to the Jews, for through him we both have access by one spirit, to the Father. 
But therefore, you are no longer, are now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And you can keep on reading. He keeps talking about it. But uh, he's saying that's, that middle wall separating the two has been broken down. Now, it's going to take time for the Israelites to get that idea. It's going to take time for these Jewish Christians to realize it. And don't get down on them about it. Don't look at those Jewish Christians and say, they're a bunch of bigoted people. That, that's, what, that's what people do today. And if you had a Facebook page and everybody would be throwing all kinds of garbage at each other or trash talking and so forth. You could say that about the church. They're, they're bigoted people. Well, they were bigoted in a sense, but you can't blame them. They were raised in Israel. And God did give them regulations that, that made them different from the countries around them. So you can understand how their mindset got to that. And this new church, the reason they became the church is they didn't just simply believe Jesus came to save the world. They believed Jesus came as the Messiah. Well, who's the Messiah for? Well, from Israel, they focused on the fact that he was the Messiah of the Jews, which is true. He's the Messiah of the Jews. What they now need to get is it goes farther. He's the Messiah of the Jews, but he's also the Messiah of the entire world, the Savior of the entire world. How many times do you read in the New Testament where you get statements like this? I believe one of them was in, uh, was in well, one of my favorite verses uh, in Romans, Romans 1.16, where it says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, which would be another word for Gentile. Why? Why would he say that, you wonder? Well, this is why. Jesus did come as the Messiah first to the Jews, but God's plan all along was that it was going to be extended to the rest of the world. And you see that phrase mentioned several times, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or the Gentile. And, and that's exactly what they're getting at. So God was in the process of changing their minds. Even on this food thing, you don't have to turn there, but in Mark chapter 7, at one point Jesus is trying to talk to the Pharisees and Sadducees and said, food isn't what defiles a person. You know, you could talk about food because they were talking about you, your, your disciples don't wash their hands like our, our rules and regulations say you're supposed to. Which, by the way, that wasn't biblical. It was what the Jewish teachers came up with to try to maintain biblical ideas. And, and Jesus said, that's not what's going to defile a person. He said, you know what defiles a person? is the things that come out of them. Adultery, uh, thievery, lying, all of those types of stuff. That's what defiles a person. But he says, no, it's not food. Well, the disciples get together with him and say, w what are you talking about? Because they were so used to trying to obey all of those rules and regulations. And Jesus said, it's not the foods. A food goes into a person's mouth and then it's eliminated from their body. But he said, that's not what defiles a person. And then there's an interesting little statement made. In, uh, it's in uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 19. And it's, it's actually an editorial comment by Mark. And we believe Mark wrote his gospel by interviewing Peter. So, so the, the gospel of Mark is actually Peter's story, if you want to put it that way. That, that's kind of how we believe that that worked out. But there's a statement that says, after Jesus said, that those things don't defile a man. And then the statement says, thus purifying all food. By the time Mark interviewed Peter, it would have been after this. Mark was written after the events of the book of Acts here. And then by that time, Peter said to Mark, Jesus was telling us that all foods, all foods have been purified. He was doing away with those regulations that we had to meticulously follow before then. So Peter's mindset is changing. Now we find that the church age is in full swing. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the, Jesus talked about them being a witness to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, that uttermost part of the earth is kicking in right here in Acts chapter 10. That's what we're seeing. And uh, the Jewish minds are being brought around to this truth. Well, let me continue on in the story. I'm back in Acts chapter 10. I'm not going to read all this for the sake of time, uh, but just sum some of it up. They have this meeting, beginning in verse 17 of Acts chapter 10. Uh, the people that uh, were sent to Peter to go get him and bring him, they came. They explained to Peter what was going on. Peter said, okay, I'll go with you. And then up in verse 24... We see them coming into uh, Caesarea, and he finds Cornelius waiting. And not just Cornelius. Cornelius went and got all his friends and family. Peter came into one of the most easy evangelistic services he was ever going to have. 
Cornelius went and got all the people around him that were also interested in worshiping God. And his family and friends brought them in. They were there. And he said, the angel told us that you would come and tell us all these things. Well, look at, um, at a couple of things that happened with this whole story. First of all, in uh, verse 23, the last part of verse 23, you could miss this, but it's actually pretty important. I know I missed it. It says, on the next day, Peter went away with them, the, the people from Cornelius, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. In other words, there were some Jewish Christians there in Joppa with Peter. They went with Peter. Now, that might seem like just a little side note. That becomes extremely important because Peter's going to need some other people to witness what he's about to witness in order to show that it actually happened. And uh, let me go up now as we're talking about this meeting between them and uh, Cornelius. Look at verse 28. Peter says, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. By the way, it wasn't unlawful according to the Bible. It was unlawful according to the Pharisees and Sadducees rules that they added to it. Let me continue. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. And he says, okay, what did you guys actually send me here for? And Cornelius goes and rehearses what was happening and what uh, the vision was that he got. Well, then Peter is able to start preaching the gospel. And that begins in verse 34. And as he preaches, one thing to think about, Peter's attitude is different here. The other sermons we see him preach in the book of Acts, Peter was very uh, inflammatory. Because of who he was preaching to. He gets to preach to the Sanhedrin. He gets to preach to some of the other religious leaders. And he is just indicting them and saying, You guys killed Jesus. And man, God had to raise him back to life. And he's getting down on them. That's not going to be his attitude here because these Gentiles weren't the ones that killed Jesus. Instead, they're looking to the gospel. And so Peter gets to preach to them. Uh, let me pick up reading in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Peter gets the point. God is not going to show partiality at this point. Anyone that comes to Jesus for salvation is going to be given salvation. Now, he's not talking about earning it when he says uh, fears God and works righteousness. But rather, what he, he's kind of summing up the whole idea. Fears God would be the idea of faith. Someone who has faith in God. They have that proper fear of who God is. And then works righteousness means they live out their faith. Their faith becomes apparent in, in the way that they're living. He says, I see that, that these people are accepted by him. Let me keep reading. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people. And he goes on and he explains who several of them were that, that witnessed this. Down to verse 43. He says, To him all the prophets witness through his name. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That's, that's the basic of the gospel right there. Whoever believes in him, that is they believe that Jesus is. Well, when Peter just actually said some of those things. He said God anointed him. That's, that's the language that they used about the Messiah. In other words, God sent Jesus as the Messiah. And all the things that Jesus did just backed up the fact that he was the Messiah. But then the Jews rejected him and they killed him. But they couldn't stop God's plan from going forward. Therefore, God raised him from the dead. And Jesus is alive today. That's the point. And Peter says, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That, that's, that's the gospel in a nutshell, if you will. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who came and died for our sins, and God raised him to life. You believe in that, you, are, you will receive remission of sins. A lot of times we add so many other ideas because we think theologically and all the things that we want to try to get in there and, and build up the gospel, and we make it sound so complicated. It's really not. Jesus came from God. He was God's man sent to be the savior of the world. He died for our sins. God raised him to life. And you can have eternal life as well. That's the idea. God has, has given him so that we can have remission of sins. And Peter got the fact that it's not just for the Jews. 
It's for everybody. I could, I could go on and on. There's lots of things here that I've got written down. You should see all the notes that I've got here. Uh, I, could, I could go to 1.30. I'm not going to do that. But I, I think most of us get it. Now, how did they respond in a verse 44 as Peter was still speaking? They were pretty rude and interrupted him, but in a good way. Because obviously their faith became real and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And, and they were baptized into the church. That's what spirit baptism is. You're added to the church. In this case, though, there was visible signs of them. They started speaking in tongues and so forth. And we're going to look next week more as to what that is. I, I don't believe that that's meant to be normative. It, you know, some people will say, I didn't speak in tongues and I got saved. I must not be saved. No, I don't believe that's the case at all. I believe God did that a few different times here in the book of Acts to show that what was happening really was from him. You know, there's a lot of people in the Bible that it shows receiving Christ as Savior who never have any type of a miraculous signs going on at the time. In fact, most of them who turn to the Lord for salvation do not have any of those things. I believe God did it strategically to show that what was happening was from him. In fact, look at what, uh, what uh, Peter said here. Um, well, verse 45, and those of the circumcision, that is the Jewish Christians that were with him, those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. You see, that's why God did it. So the Jewish Christians would see it's not just them. It's whoever turns to Jesus for salvation. We're going to get into chapter 11 next week where Peter has to go back and report it. And some people are a little upset because he went to the Gentiles. But Peter's going to basically tell them, look, God did for them what he did for us. Who was I to stand in the way? You know, This is what God is doing with the gospel. Well, we need to rejoice in the Lord because salvation is open to all of us. All of us have the opportunity of turning to the Lord for salvation. That means me. It also means every one of you have the opportunity to turn to the Lord for salvation. I know that most of you already have. But the opportunity and the invitation is there for every one of us. Uh, every one of us here who, who has turned to Christ for salvation was an impossible case at one point. Think about that. You didn't have enough Jewish blood flowing in your veins. That might have made it seem impossible. Um, you're part of the human race, and the Bible says that all humans are sinners because of uh, Adam and Eve. The story flows right from them. We're all sinners. But even worse than that, we've all been proven sinners. We are all individually sinners. Some of us have done some pretty bad stuff. Probably an awful lot of us would not want to share the things from our past. I don't want to share things from my past. But you know what? None of that was bad enough to keep me away from the gospel of Jesus. None of it was bad enough to make it to where I couldn't be saved. And there's not anything that any of you could do that would make you bad enough to where you couldn't turn to Christ for salvation and be completely forgiven. Oh, you might say, yeah, but what about the one unpardonable sin, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Well, if you go and look at blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, was unbelief. They didn't believe that it really was the Holy Spirit, and they said it was the devil. And, and so if you've got unbelief, you're not going to want to turn anyway, right? But if you want to turn, you're not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. In fact, you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. All of us can turn to the Lord for salvation. And, and this is where it gets started right here. The, the gospel, the family of God is open to all of us and for all of us. I'd like us to sing a song that will celebrate that fact. If you'll turn in your hymnals to hymn number 293, let's sing Amazing Grace. 